Hey church, good to see you this morning. We wish we could see you in person, but until we can, I will happily stare into this camera and we'll do the best we can. We're eagerly anticipating hearing your voices on the Zoom call, rather the bridge call here in just a little while. I hope that things are going well for you over there. We're doing the best we can over here to stay safe and to keep our neighbors safe. So in these uncertain times with lots of things going on, let's talk just a little bit this morning about who we are and uh, what God has called us to be. And I want to um, want to have this conversation in three particular phases. The first phase is I just want to remember what it means to talk about the gospel. In the New Testament, the gospel is a particular term. It was not a religious term in the first century world. By the time Jesus comes into the world, it was actually already a term used widely in reference to Caesar. It was a political term and a military term. Uh, it was a term that meant in their day that uh, a battle had been won, whether a military battle or a political battle, and a victory had been gained. And so it was good news, but not good news of just any sort. It was the good news of victory. And so if your city-state was out battling another city-state and the battle had been won and decided in your favor, they would send runners back to your city with the gospel, the good news of victory. And so to tell the gospel of Jesus Christ, to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, is to tell or believe in or enact or follow along with a very particular kind of story. And the New Testament writers, um, all of the New Testament writers, but particularly Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who wrote Gospels, this is their telling of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, they tell precisely that kind of story. It's the good news of the victory of Jesus over the powers. And it's a story in which the um, old king, the powers over the way things are, who do not rule by right or because God had given them the throne necessarily, but because those of us in our sinfulness and our fallenness have followed after them, those powers are defeated and dethroned and cast aside, and through his crucifixion and his resurrection and finally his ascension to the right hand of God, Jesus takes the throne that rightfully belonged to God. The Gospel is a story about uh, old kings, wicked kings, brutal kings, violent kings that hold sway over the long darkness of the brokenness of our world being cast aside and the rightful king ushering in as it were the dawning of a new day and those of us who follow Jesus as he sits on his throne having dethroned those over the way things are in favor of the way things should be are those who have committed ourselves to um, turning our back on that long darkness and facing the coming day of God's kingdom. And so this is the gospel. Jesus has won the victory. Jesus is seated on the throne. This was the gospel for Matthew and for Mark and for Luke and for John and for Paul and for James and uh, for whoever wrote Hebrews and for Jude and Peter and this was in the early church what the gospel meant. Jesus has won the victory over the dark powers that hold sway over the way things are, the way the world works, and now he is seated on his throne at the right hand of God in heaven. And he is working to, he hasn't finished, but he is working to usher in the way things should be. And so we have texts like um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul says, Behold, for everyone that is in Christ, creation is new. All the old has passed away, as past tense. All the new has come. And he goes on to describe us as a people of reconciliation, because God is reconciling the world to himself. And so we start with the gospel because we are a gospel people. We are called by the gospel. We are formed in the gospel. We are shaped by the gospel. And so the most fundamental truth of our reality in these uncertain times, when all sorts of people are vying for power and control and promoting their agendas, we are 
the ones who start by saying that Jesus sits on his throne in heaven. And all of those powers, all of those systems, all of those agendas that can be, after careful consideration and discernment, identified with the darkness of the way things are, those things are the things we cast aside, or at least give some side eye to, because we are people who do not face the long darkness, but the coming rising of the new day on horizon. We are Jesus people. Jesus is King. And as it turns out, that coming of the new day is a great thing for a lot of people in the world. It's no surprise that Jesus, when he announces the coming of God's kingdom, the arrival of the way things should be in the midst of the way things are, that this was pronounced as good news for those who were hopeless or those who were grieving or those who were broken by the world or those who had been cast aside as losers in the world. Because to say that someone, anyone, sits on the throne that they preside over either the way things are or the way things should be is also to say that they bring with them, with their authority, with their kingdom, as it were, a certain way of life. And Jesus, now seated on his throne, calls us to a different way of life. And this gets to the heart of the second thing that always comes with the declaration that Jesus is now king, and that is that that declaration leads us to the call for repentance. Now, we think of repentance sometimes in um, mostly religious terms. It has become kind of one of those churchy words that we use in worship or we talk about it in a Bible study, but we oftentimes don't think about it or, or talk about it much other than those situations. But in Jesus' day, as with gospel, repentance was a term that was used more broadly. And it had political connotations, it had military connotations, it had concrete social connotations. And we could illustrate this in one of two ways. Uh, the first would be the story that I'm sure I've told you before of Josephus. Josephus, of course, was a historian um, and a thinker, a Jewish man, around the same time as Jesus. And later he would write his autobiography. And he would tell this story about one time during the Jewish wars where he was on one side of the battle and his enemies on the other side of the battle decided that they needed to assassinate him. So they hired an assassin. And the assassin uh, laid in wait for him. He was going to set a trap for him and he was going to ambush him and assassinate him. But Josephus finds out about the plot. And so Josephus sets a trap for the one setting a trap for him. He captures this assassin. And in his autobiography, he says something very interesting to him. He, he says uh, to the assassin once he's captured him, he says, look, I know who you are, and I know who sent you, and I know what they sent you for. But if you will trust me and follow me, then I will let you live. And in Greek, it's interesting that that um, language, if you will trust me and follow me, I will let you live, is language that we would be very familiar with, although it's translated in different terms in the Bible. What he literally says there is, if you will repent and believe in me, I will let you live. And so this notion of repentance that comes about from the gospel, this notion of repentance that flows from the declaration that Jesus is king is really nothing more than the notion of pledging our allegiance to a new king, to a new way of life. Uh, when Herod the Great was reigning, he lived through the first part of his reign in a time of political turmoil. There was no emperor in Rome. As a matter of fact, Augustus Caesar, who had become the first emperor, Octavian, was fighting his enemies in the Senate, and one by one those enemies in the Senate fell until there was just one senator and Octavian left, and whoever won that battle would decide the outcome of Roman history, and in many ways the history of the world. And Herod the Great backed the senator, who then lost, which of course put him in a precarious position, because here he was, one of the kings under Roman sway, and the Romans had been involved in a civil war, and he had supported the loser. And so what Herod does is he goes to Augustus, the newly minted Roman emperor, the one in charge of the known world at that time, and uh, Herod's life held in the balance, hung in the balance. 
with this conversation. But he goes to Augustus Caesar and he says to him, he says, now I don't have to tell you that, um, I don't have to tell you that I did not support you in the Civil War. I supported your enemy and your enemy lost. You have won. All of that is known. He says, but what I want you to do is I want you to focus on not that I was on the opposing side during the war, but I want you to see how loyal of a friend I was to your enemy, and I want you to know, O oh Emperor, that now I will be just as loyal to you. In other words, what Herod did is he went to the new king. He went to the new power once the old power had been set aside and the new one was seated on the throne, and he says, I now pledge my allegiance to you. And so when the gospel goes forth, by the way, this was Augustus Caesar's term, the gospel of Augustus Caesar. The news went throughout the Roman Empire that Augustus now sat on the throne. The old powers had been taken care of. The new king was now ruling. When the gospel of Jesus goes forth, there is a call for repentance. When you hear the gospel, you're going to have to decide. You're going to have to decide whether you're going to remain loyal to those old powers and the way of life that they have brought to bear on the world or whether or not you're going to pledge your allegiance to the new king the rightful king and this by the way and we really should give more focus to this this is not just something you do when you become a Christian <clears throat> churches overall would do well to um, deeply and reflectively and constantly ask questions about whether or not they are in real and practical and on the ground ways actually pledging allegiance to Jesus or to those old powers that they say that they've forsaken because the powers bring a way of doing business in the world and Jesus brings an alternative way of doing business in the world and for all of the communions we take and for all of the times that we are baptized for all of the songs we sing for all of the verses in the Bible we read for all of our rhetoric and our talk about being Jesus people and all of the ways that we think that we express that on Sunday morning if we do not take up Jesus's way of life if we do not pledge our allegiance to him in response to the gospel that he is king if we give him lip service but continue living in the way that the powers have always trained us and taught us and formed us to live then um we're not really pledging allegiance to Jesus. And so, what does this way look like? Well, the way of the world, the way things are, is a way that is, of course, uh, rooted in fear. We uh, see this throughout Scripture, but we also see it in our lives. Uh, fear drives so much of what we do. And fear is allowed to drive so much of what we do because we live in a world that is fundamentally in this darkness that is fading away, controlled by death. And so you could take plenty of examples going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, but we will not go back that far. We'll start in Exodus. In Exodus chapter 1, the Pharaoh, who had forgotten all of the contributions Joseph made, looks across the land and he sees the, the Hebrew people in Exodus chapter 1. And he sees that their birth rate is going through the roof, that they're growing, that their population is soaring. And he starts to get afraid. He's afraid that if a battle came, if war descended on Egypt, then uh, the Hebrews would side with the Egyptian enemies and they would have enough strength to defeat the Egyptians. And so in his fear, and this is the way it goes in the world, in his fear, he sought to exert power and control over the thing he was afraid of. That is the way of the world, a story of fear and power. I'm afraid the Hebrews might do us dirty. I'm afraid the Hebrews might hurt us. And so he enacts a variety of policies that begins with forced work and enslavement. It ends in genocide as he calls on all loyal Egyptians to throw Hebrew babies into the Nile. And he does all of this seeking to exert power over them because he is afraid. This is the way we do things in the world. It's an election year. 
and uh, if we're not careful we will see that our elections can and often do and in my lifetime almost always have descended into nothing more than the story of fear and power I'm afraid of what will happen if the other person wins I'm afraid of what will happen if this person gets four more years do you know what trouble our nation will be in if such and such gets control and so what we need to do to prevent them from getting control from this bad thing happening is we need to marshal all of our power we need to outshout them we need to outspend them we need to get more votes than them we suppose that the way that we address our anxieties and our fears is by getting more power but of course you can see throughout history starting with Exodus moving forward from there that this program of fear and power um, creates a rather dark and a bleak world and Jesus comes into this world that was so deeply shaped by fear and power I mean it was still there when when Rome was present when Jesus was born this was Caesar Augustus's MO he was the bringer of peace so called but he brought peace by the point of a sword. He's the one who said, um, you'll either cooperate with us, or if you don't cooperate with us, we'll smush you flat like a bug, and we will call that flat wasteland where you used to live a peaceful place. Jesus comes into this world, and he says, I, I want to, in my kingdom, call you to a new way of doing things. And that new way of doing things, that, that on the ground, that practical, that everyday nitty gritty result of repentance, Jesus would say, looks like the cross. His command was very simple. If you would be my disciple, take up your cross and follow after me. And the cross for Jesus is the clearest expression of the way that this new kingdom works. He would say, for instance, in John chapter 13, he says, A new commandment now I am giving you. And in the, the language of John chapter 13, what he's talking about is, is the bedrock of this new order, the bedrock of this new way of doing things as I usher in the way things should be over the way things are the end of the day the foundation of it looks like this this new command this new way of life I give you that you should love one another the way that I love you and he says people will know that you belong to me that you have pledged your allegiance to me when you love one another the way I loved you and it's interesting that he begins that chapter in the upper room right before Passover washing his disciples feet here is the king of all the universe God made flesh all of the power that we could imagine in existence embodied in one person and he lays that power down to wash his disciples feet to take on the form of a slave and in the next chapter um, he is going to begin his march towards the cross greater love has no man than this they lay down their life for the friend for their friends for Jesus the greatest embodiment of this ethic of the kingdom this new way of doing things the way the world works when it works as it should is not fear and power is actually the rejection of fear and power but it is laying power down and trust that God will do what is right it is taking up a cruciform life in which we lay our power down for the sake of serving others for the sake of decreasing ourselves while others increase for the sake of being vulnerable trusting that God will do what is right this is of course what Peter is telling us in first Peter chapter 2 at the end has been talking about through first Peter chapter 2 all of these ways in which um, the Christians of the early church are being persecuted or are undergoing hardship and he says that we've been called to a very particular sort of response in this situation that Jesus is our example to this we have been called he says and he says that Jesus was the one who lays his power down goes to the cross trusting that God will take care of him and of course that trust was vindicated in the resurrection 
Jesus gave up his life rather than taking the lives of his enemies, trusting that God would do what was right in the resurrection was God doing what was right. And so we are those who stand in a cruciform posture in the world, fearless and rooted in the hope of resurrection. We refuse to play games of fear and power to whatever degree we find them, wherever we find them, because those are the machinations of the old way, and we have pledged our allegiance to a new king. And that new king advocates a new way, a way that loves even when it hurts, a way that loves even when there are enemies, a way that loves even when it seems foolish, because we know that even in the face of the foolishness of the world, even in the face of the weakness of the world, God will do what is right. And so we don't have to fear the things the world fears, because God is bigger than those things. Rather, we can give witness to a new way of doing things in the world because God is bigger than those things and He has won the victory. And so church, this week, as all of the things of 2020 swirl around us and call for our attention and demand that we act in certain ways or we really don't care, remember who you are. Because when you come to the table, whether we're able to do it at the building down in Fernville or we have to do it from our homes because the pandemic, because we're trying to take care of one another and our neighbors, when we come to the table, we pledge our allegiance anew to the king who calls us to a different way. When we remember our baptisms, we remember that we were baptized into a different way. We are the people who have taken up this different way. And so we are the people who live in the midst of the darkness formed by fear and power. And we turn our back to that darkness and we face the coming of the new day. And we live cross-shaped lives made possible rooted in the resurrection of Jesus, the down payment on God doing what is right for all of us. And so I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and then I'm going to turn you guys loose on the world in whatever ways you can this week. God, give us the courage to be your people and the wisdom to be your people. Make us cruciform. Make us like Jesus. Help us to hold on to the hope we have in resurrection with you. And now we come together and we pray as your people. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen.